It's a pleasure to see you all, and the audience changes pretty much every time in a magical way. So I'll, in, I'll introduce myself. I'm Paola Antonelli. I work here at the Museum of Modern Art as a senior curator of architecture and design and as a, a director of R&D, and that's my hat for tonight. R&D is not a typical department in a museum, but we started this experiment a few years ago to, uh, to just prove that museums can be the R&D of society, that museums can help people think about their daily life, big and small challenges, in a more expedient and in, more, in a deeper way sometimes, by just allowing them to think of uh, important matters, matters that count, to, let, to allow them to let artists help them or guide them or inspire them or irritate them into dealing with everyday life. So with that in mind, we started these salons, and we're now at number 26. Um, salons that deal with big, big topics. You know, we dealt with taboos, we dealt with death, we dealt with truth at uh, pretty much the time of the 2016 elections, and uh, with protest. And to that, tonight, we would like to deal with friction. It's fascinating to see how many people react to friction in an almost visceral way, even though it's not that easy to define. You know, so, and Erica Petrillo, who is, where are you, Erica? Um, yeah, she's uh, the wonderful uh, research researcher that works with me on R&D and that prepares all these great uh, PowerPoints and more. We disagreed on what friction is. And uh, it's quite interesting because she chose as a symbol image this view of Europa, Europa, the moon of Jupiter that is particularly scarred and devastated by ice age after ice age that kind of carved these fissures and this incredible painful scratches in the surface. And indeed, that is friction. But friction is also the ability to uh, grasp and to change direction. And you see here the classical scales of the shark that are so celebrated because they not only enable the shark to defend itself, but also to change direction very expediently. What we were reacting to uh, choosing friction as a subject is the myth of seamlessness. Seamlessness gets on our nerves and on many of our nerves. And you know, it's really interesting. It's, it's, it's almost like um, the idea of seamlessness is best represented by curling, but curling is a combination of seamlessness, of like smoothness and friction. You know, I didn't know much about it, but it's this kind of like joint teamwork in which you at the same time use the ability of these like stones to like fly on ice, but then sometimes you also have to use the room to create friction by scratching the ice in front so that they can change direction. So it's a wonderful chess game on ice where the, uh, the table is set by the gamers at any time. But then in this digital age, we have this myth of seamlessness. We were looking at this Accenture report that was talking about how people, especially millennials, sorry, it's always about the millennials, uh, want to have experiences, especially in retail. And it was all seamless, 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 like 15 apparitions of the word seamless in the same page. In truth, I thought that this was seamless. And if you don't mind letting Mr. Magoo play, I would appreciate it. This has always been one of my favorite cartoons because it's this image of like one after the other points of friction and danger and Mr. Magoo that seamlessly flies through them. So these continuous metaphors of seamlessness are best represented by the digital myth, the myth of the of digital society. What you're looking at here is a, a, a beautiful work by Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby who hypothesized their great uh, speculative designers and theoretician of design and they uh, speculated that there will be a future. They did this in 2012, and they speculated a future in which Scotland and Wales would drop from the face of the earth, and Britain and England would remain onto itself. It's funny. It was before Brexit. It's kind of a counter reality to Brexit. And they hypothesized that the four remaining micro kingdoms were ruled by different people. We will not go into the bioliberals and commune nuclearists and anarcho-evolutionists right now. We will instead concentrate on the digit digitarians. And the digitarians were governed by people or algorithms. Who cares who governs so long as everything is smooth and runs seamlessly, right? So there was this myth of the seamlessness. 
And uh, the whole kingdom is guided by market forces, by technocracy, and people have illusionary choices. They don't really have a choice. They follow market uh, forces. So seamlessness as a myth for the digital era is coinciding also with the myth of people being nice to each other. I don't know if you remember this incredible essay and book by Barbara Ehrenreich. When she was found to have breast cancer in 2009, she was surrounded by pink ribbons and platitudes, and she got really, really angry and uh, published a book that was called How po Smile or Die, How Positive Thinking Fooled America and the World. And it was really quite fascinating because she was really talking about positive thinking as a form of social control, which we know uh, also by, from pictures by Kim, Kim Jong-un, you know, who's always like big and smiling, that positive thinking can be a way to control society. And uh, there are many examples, like for instance, when Condoleezza Rice, after the declaration of the war in Iraq, dared say that it was not necessarily such a good idea, and she was completely silenced. So this idea of positive thinking as a way, as a form of control can be seen across the aisle. And that's what Barbara Ehrenreich was reacting against. And of course, also Martha Rosler, who's here tonight, and uh, the very famous essay that she wrote in 2016, Why Are People Being So Nice?, that referred in particular to the art world, was a jolt to the system for many curators and cultural operators, if you want to call them so. It's the idea that the demand, especially in neoliberal terms, for the wholesale invention, performance, and perpetual grooming of a transactional self. The idea that people that work in the world of art, especially curators and people that work in galleries, have to always be transactional and to always be nice in order to facilitate a conversation that doesn't have that much of a meaning. But to make a long story short, the essay, essay was so influential that a curatorial group called De Apple in Amsterdam actually created a workshop, a four-day workshop that was all based on this idea of uh, people in the cultural sector being nice. And I find it very funny because if there are some people that are not so nice and that I admire for that reason are the Dutch, God bless them. So <laughs> I liked the fact that it was, it was happening actually in Amsterdam. And our own Pablo Elguera, who works here in the education department, and he's also a wonderful cartoonist, uh, was asked to make a cartoon, and I don't know if you can see it, but the civil war has descended into such chaos that our only chance is to bring a curator to make a biennial out of it. So it really is interesting that we've become the kind of beautifiers and the optimizers of pretty much anything that comes into the world, the decorators of politics. It's, uh, that's how Martha actually framed it in a way. So uh, friction is very fascinating. You know, another conversation that Eric and I were having is that friction is not a frontal uh, attack or collision, but rather it's about two forces gliding against each other and scarring each other. And uh, a few years ago, we had here at MoMA a beautiful debate, like a live Oxford-style <laughs> debate, between Lawrence Lessig, you know, the, the uh, professor and lawyer from Harvard, and Gabriella Coleman, who's the foremost expert on online hacking and wrote the book on Anonymous. And uh, the theme, the motion, was quite interesting. It was, internet freedom and digital privacy will come about only through the design of better tools for civil disobedience and direct action. So you see, friction doesn't happen by saying, is internet freedom good or bad, and putting a Republican and a Democrat against each other, but rather putting two people that have similar ideas but a disagreement about some important topic, having a great conversation that because of that abrasion and friction leads everybody else to actually develop new ideas that bring us forward. So friction is about progress, is about pushing us forward. And uh, uh, also this wonderful emancipated duel can speak to that. So the emancipated duel actually happened in 1892 between Princess 
Pauline von Metternich and Countess Anastasia Kilmanzig. It happened in Vienna because the two disagreed on the floral decorations for the Vienna musical and theatrical exhibition. It's the truth. And it was um, a duel that was not at the last, you know, it, it was not life or death. It was just like the first blo blood that was drawn. Um, the witnesses were all women. And actually, one of the witnesses was Baroness Lubinska, who was a doctor, and she insisted that the two ladies go topless so that the fabrics would not provoke infections or create danger. So it was like very precise rules, and uh, it was like a form of emancipation. And the reason why this image is here is not only because it's wonderful, but also <laughs> because it speaks about the fact that duels and friction uh, have rules. And in a way, we live in the city that prides itself with being about friction and about rules. And it's really fascinating. We always, we go about life um, colliding with each other every day, but we know how to avoid each other. And it's fascinating. I'm seeing something like that in India, looking at traffic where there are so many different uh, types of, of, of traffic and people and animals and cars in the street and they all avoid each other. New York is like that because there are some rules that need to be respected, some rules that to us are very important. You might recall, remember this uh, wonderful cover of The New Yorker that hypothesized our dream with all the tourists in one lane because they don't know how to move and instead we move the way we know how to move. And there will be, you know, tonight there's going to be one minute videos that are provided by wonderful collaborators and there's one that is about walking rage and I suffer from that. You know when you're territorial, territorial you see somebody that's walking your way and it's in your, in your lane and you start hating the person from afar and you want to kill them and you just prepare the shoulder. Yeah, so it's really quite fascinating. Rules are important and rules make you grow and that's why whenever I go back home to Italy I find uh, Italian children so childish because New York children have uh, an earlier degree and a, and a bigger degree of development. And uh, I was looking at Jean Piaget and I was uh, listening also to Erica explain his work. Jean Piaget, you might know, uh, wrote this amazing book called The Genesis of, logical, of Elementary Logical Structures. And he studied children and, and developmental process, cognitive processes at the beginning of the 20th century and later on. And he theorized basically the idea that cognitive development is not, um, is not happening in, uh, in, in kind of uh, a linear way, but rather it's happening in leaps and bounds. And daily abrasions are natural and beneficial. So cognitive development is a process of biological maturation by interaction with the environment. He was studying the fact that children answering tests were much more interesting when they were trying to explain their perceived mistakes. They were not really mistakes, were just other ways to answer. So the important, it's almost like going to the gym with your muscles, right? It's the same thing. There are these different degrees. There's adaptation, accommodation, and habituation. Let's say there's an obstacle, a friction. You first adapt to the friction. Then you accommodate the friction. So going around the obstacle becomes the solution. You learn to go around the obstacle. The problem happens with habituation when you become numb to it. So in a way, uh, friction is important because it's the avoidance of habituation. It's almost like a drug, almost. You know, you become addicted and then you need more. Um, of that friction. And it's our job as museums, as artists, as uh, citizens to make sure that friction exists in our lives and in the life of our children and, our, uh, and the people around us. This book by Daniel Pink talked about motivation and interestingly talked about the fact that humans are motivated by usually three uh, main pulsions. And I love Daniel Pink. There's always many ways to explain how humans behave, but this was quite interesting. One is autonomy, you know, the ability to do things by yourself. Another one is purpose, of course, thinking of a purpose in, in life. But the one that is important for us today is the, the concept of mastery, being able to develop a real ability or skill. And that happens through friction, through continuous progress and the urge to overcome difficulties. There was um, a beautiful article that we found on why we should design things to be more difficult to use. Once again, we go back to seamlessness. Um, One-shot cameras, you know, uh, point-and-shoot cameras have become less successful because of iPhones and uh, other smartphones, of course, but also because people were fed up 
with that ease of use. And instead, cameras like Leica's have had a renaissance lately. When things are really seamless, we look for friction. And we look for things that are not that easy to use. And in a way, Rube Goldberg comes back into our lives, a little bit like Mr. Magoo. And a certain complication uh, is, is considered a plus and not a minus. You can bring that to many other spheres of life if you just think about it, um, from making honey at home to uh, many. You can just like go through your own life and you'll find many of those particular moments. Uh, another really um, manifestation of friction can happen in fashion. And we were looking at uh, uh, aestheticizations of friction. Vivienne Westwood was accused at the time of the punk movement of aestheticizing what instead was a political and social malaise. And, uh, uh, and well, in that case, then Margiela just transformed that particular friction into art. I just came back from uh, Paris where I saw his exhibition at the Galliera Museum and every single outfit is friction and every single outfit propels you forward in places you had never thought of before. Um, last but not least, Alessandro Michele and Gucci, one could argue that the amazing success he's having, even though it's a little more um, light-hearted than any Margiela and any Westwood, is because of this idea of friction, of clashing together styles in uh, a seamless way. Um, Beautifully, friction is about life and keeps you alert. I don't know how many of you know about Tulloch Spike. So um, Tulloch, I don't remember his first, Gordon. Gordon Tulloch was an economist who argued that in order to keep people alert, you have to increase risk. And the Tulloch Spike shows, shows it very well. You see it there, you know, and you see it also here. The idea is that if you have a spike, you're going to be a much more attentive and careful driver. And also what happened on Exhibition Road in South Kensington in London is really interesting. The government um, decided to declutter some of the streets in London by removing the urban furniture that normally kind of keeps between quotes citizens safe. So no more, um, no more um, crossing signs, no more divisions and uh, what are they called, Bull bullions? I mean, no more divisions. And all of a sudden, everybody has to fend for themselves and they have to be careful. When you cross the street, you have to make sure cars are not coming and cars have to make sure that pedestrians are not walking. So this kind of situation of, of uh, what, what do they call? Oh, bollards, thank you so much. Um, this kind of situation of, of anarchy is a situation that should improve safety. And in fact, it did, it reduced the uh, accidents by 30% on that particular road. Um, another beautiful thing that happened in London are kindergartens and uh, uh, kiddie parks with risk in it. You know, sandbox have been eliminated for the longest time and instead bring back the sandbox. There are nails and uh, cutters inside and they say, you know, one of the teachers said, oh yeah, they cut themselves but once only. So it's quite beautiful. The idea that bring back the danger and, uh, and they'll come, you know, and they'll grow up faster. So it's quite fantastic to see that this is happening. In a way, you can think of also R&D here at MoMA as a celebration of friction. Um, you don't have to pay to come here. You just have to respond. You might not come if you don't want to, and I will never know. But the fact that I send you the reading list, and you know that I've gone through um, you know, work, actually, Erica, more than me, but you know, it's like we've been working, and the fact that we want you to work, in a way, puts you on the alert. You come here, and you get more out of it. And I get more, and we get more, Eric and I get more out of your presence. And the myth that uh, the online world is about eliminating friction is, has been already uh, kind of reneged by many different manifestations. And one of them, one of my favorite, is the Gallery of Lost Art. There was uh, an online exhibition organized by the Tate Modern a few years ago in which Art that had been lost, you know, lost to Nazi loot, lost to fires, lost, you know, you know, great modern art that had been gone was celebrated in this virtual gallery online, but just for a year. We're used to the fact that things online last forever. No, that had an expiration date. After a year, it's gone and it's gone forever. That's friction. The fact of having limitations, of having difficulties, of having abrasions, of having, um, of having all sorts of provocations is important for us to grow. And we could have gone on forever by celebrating comedians, politicians, historical figures that have used friction to wake up and to 
begin a discussion, but instead of us doing that, we will let our speakers actually help us with, uh, with this discussion. And uh, we have a pretty amazing panel. The first to, to speak will be Martha Rossler, who especially in this context doesn't need any introduction. Amazing artist, not only the author of that, uh, of that essay, but also the author of so much art that is certainly not about being nice. So it's really great to have her here, Martha. It's a pleasure to have you here. Then we will have Tzige Tafese. Tzige is the, one of the founder of BUFU, that means by us, for us, and uh, I think it's a play on FUBU probably, or for us, by us, so we'll find out more about it, but it's a, it's a group of curators and artists that talk about um, the decentralizing whiteness in a way. It's about connections, it's about relationship between African American and Asian culture, but that's only a departure point to talk about much more about any kind of identity, uh, identity fluidity and decentralization. Um, then we will have Kasha Urbaniak. Kasha is, uh, uh, is an expert in power. She teaches power. She teaches power to women. She used to be a dominatrix, but at the same time, she also studied Shintoism and really tried to understand the dynamics of power at a religious, spiritual, and also practical level. And so it's going to be really interesting to hear what she has to say. And last but not least, my dear friend Brian Collins, who's an, uh, a communicator extraordinaire. He's a designer. He's an ad, ad man. And uh, he is the winner of many great prizes for advertising campaigns. So he knows how to get to people. So uh, also so we will have a few videos interspersed between the various presentations and we'll start with the first video that is in my in my honor it's about walking rage please start the whole video Pedestrian rage is a culturally learned aggressive behavior style of walking and standing in public places. Walking rage is a public show of force against other pedestrians who are perceived to violate a biological imperative regarding territorial rights. Walking in crowded places is essentially competitive, which makes pedestrians vulnerable to each other by threatening the personal space bubble that everyone is taught to observe and respect for the sake of public civility and health safety. The danger of collision becomes real and problematic. Walking rage is occasioned when some people occupy and use the sidewalk or pathway in opposite ways. Those who want to walk at a fast pace are defeated by those who want to meander slowly and even stand still while talking or looking at their smartphones. Both sides are exhibiting walking rage. Those whose faster pace is prevented and those who know they're not supposed to block the passageway. The passive aggressive blocker matches the rage of the blocked pedestrian trying to whiz by and protesting vehemently by throwing out insults or by bumping and ramming their way through. I consider walking rage, like road rage and shopping cart rage, to be a public mental health crisis that needs to be addressed and reversed. <laughs> Martha, please. <laughs> Pointer, help. I'm here for you. Anything you need. The PowerPoint you move with this big green arrow. And if you want also the laser, this is the laser. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I hate being first. But I will be the most irritating, I think. Um, it's my job. Um, right. I want to enter the discussion about friction through a linguistic door. A few years ago, I began to notice a certain stilted set of verbal expressions and messages, ads, and emails emanating from the art world. Celeb celebratory words expressing excitement as in, we are thrilled, 
had supplanted other expressions of pride or pleasure. Merriam-Webster suggests to be thrilled means to experience a sudden sharp excitement, to tingle or throb, tremble or vibrate, charged up like a battery. Other words might serve. Oh, I should say there's a, gonna be something of a disconnect here. I don't, I believe in the friction between what's on the screen and your desire to listen to me or not. Other words might serve, elated, enthusiastic, overjoyed, joyful, ecstatic, or entranced, or delirious or rapturous, passionate or exhilarated, but none has quite the cachet of thrilled with its etymological derivation from thurlin, thrillin, to pierce. Thrilled suggests a certain elevated excitement, incandescent but restrained, and attests to an emotional response affecting the speaker or, by extension, the institution. It testifies to affect. Affect is the stock in trade of the art world, although it's shared by much else in daily life. Art institutions join every other sales-oriented industry in agreeing that the provision of experiences is paramount to success. But can this explain why everyone is being so nice, so kind, so polite, so friendly? Except when they have sidewalk rage and most other times. A detour is warranted here. Over the past 50 years, high art has been shoved off its perch at the apex of cultural meaning, its structures and institutions riddled with strategies borrowed from the mass media, advertising, and fashion. The contest over the provider of aesthetic experiences and their shape and form entailed a contest over the term creative and in which pursuits and industries it resides. Leading contenders are technology, architecture, design, fashion, and advertising. Not so great for artists. Today, in our heavily knowledge-based data-centric society, in the US at least, those damn millennials are far less drawn to the pleasures of sheer accumulation. Are we having a sound issue? No. Really? OK, maybe it was a drop in the subway sound. They're far less drawn to the pleasures of sheer accumulation of material goods than, oh. Thank you. That seems more comfortable. Than to those derived from, oh, I have to say this again. Millennials are far less drawn to the pleasures of sheer accumulation of material goods than to those derived <clears throat> from less material or object-oriented pursuits. Much of this, our economy, often called the immaterial economy, but taking in the burgeoning service sector, is unwaged or poorly waged and precarious, a gig economy. That's a very low-key invitation to be a mechanical Turk or to rent one. There have been several setbacks and crashes along the way to our tech economy, like recessions and crashes from the previous industrial one. One notable fix was the neoliberal shock of the 1980s, engineered largely by Margaret Thatcher, seconded by Ronald Reagan, with secretive policy groups in the background that saved the bacon for the advanced economies, austerity, privatization, outsourcing of work, prohibitively expensive education, and a shredded social safety net, and a destroyed power of labor unions, aggressively curtailed, as we see in today's Supreme Court decision in Janus relating to public sector workers. Another wonderful move. So, And now, an endless number of stats, I advise you read the headline and look at the pshht, flying charts. Uh, so it won't take too much time. You will get the picture. Workers produced much more, but the pay lag behind. The top 1% grew 138%, while wages for the bottom 90 grew 15%. That's nasty. Stagnant wages for middle wage workers, declining wages for low wage workers. And middle wage 
that's sort of most of us, except for the other ones who are low. The minimum wage would be over $18 had it risen along with productivity. The erosion of collective bargaining hurts all workers. And if you know anything about how the labor, the field of labor works, it's because it raises the floor. Um, the figure shows the drop in the share of workers under collective bargaining co contracts is the mirror image of the rise of incomes of the top 10%. Whoop, nasty. Okay. Neoliberalism produced the generation of young workers born in the 80s and after who grew up understanding that there were no guarantees, no lifetime jobs, no pension, no retirement, and a world of competition. You're on your own unless you come from money and you need to fashion uh, a marketable persona, a distinctive brand. It's not looking so great for them either. Not good wages, not good health care, but the CEO pay grabs the larger share of wages and this higher pay does not reflect any increased contribution to corporate output. Take that, CEOs. They now make 296 times what a typical worker earns, but notice before the financial crash, they were making 383 times. So, and that's times. Okay. Okay. Aggressive corporate sharks and downsizers of the 1980s and 90s, the Carl Icahn's, and the notorious chainsaw Al Dunlap had led the way to the drastic reorganization of work and the end of the great post-war labor management compromise. On firing a morale officer whose job was to ensure harmony in the executive suite, the hell with harmony. These people should have been tearing each other's hair out, demanding to know why the company was getting its ass beat every day. He's a local boy. Um, the threatening robot revolution has led savvy technocrats to revise proposals for a guaranteed universal income to avoid uprisings and revolutions. But the wooing of the new knowledge workers and the rise of the service industries and consumers of its high-touch, high-tech products required a new management style. Back to the webinar. Friction-free relationships. Use word-for-word -word scripts. Practice in front of a mirror. So we get soft and permissive. Oh, in the interest of frictionlessness with our, without transactional costs, or low transactional costs, I'm sorry. So we get soft and permissive for tech workers and soothing to customers, but not precariously employed gig economy workers. But for the lucky ones, everything falls under the provision of experiences of one sort or another. Museums in the experience economy promise not cultivation and contemplation, but rather edification and amazement for visitors of every age and social class. The experience economy de uh, demands authenticity, which axiomatically takes shape as heightened faux emotion. As to the art world, whose denizens have been likened to a nobility, a group captive to royalty and haute bourgeois elites, uh, but retaining uh, aspirations toward favor and access, we can look back at some of our predecessors and current friends. Um, Ambition, bankable information, flattery, gossip, infighting, competitiveness in both manners and physical display, all figure in the production of a set of deep bowing courtiers who hope to gain entry to the inner sanctum. This is just a list of when and how to stand, sit, bow, and curtsy. Um, when you leave court, it's proper to bow or curtsy, walk to about 10 or, 10 feet, 10 or 20 feet from the thrones and bow or curtsy again. Um, I think the reason that 
to, yeah, sure. Believe it or not, I've got one sentence left. Uh, we wear black, so we don't have to compete in terms of our clothing. I believe that was the choice. But you're not wearing black. You're sort of wearing black. You have a little, little bit of red. red. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't expect you, you to read this, but the salary for curators is not so great. The young non-managerial staff and those in art-related fields, female in high proportions, work almost nonstop on call 24-7. In their email communications, the salutation is followed by the rote but heartbreaking phrase, I hope this message finds you well. I got one today. A phrase that smacks of a pre-modern imaginary, a Victorianism that likely never was, to suggest a warmth and concern that cannot pertain. The stilted faux sentiment, like the communication of thrill, is a nervous tick emanating from the escalating courtliness of art world social relations among those needing to serve the top dogs in this pink collar ghetto, but also expanding throughout. <laughs> when we complain about the night we're mayor of the art world as driven by the market and its increasingly institutionalized and rigidified path to success, we should remember we often, generally, participate in it and its alienating search for a competitive advantage with hardly a thought on how that resonates on every level. It's time to say no more Mr. Mr. Nice Guy and insert some fr friction <laughs> into the system. The question is how. Thanks. Thank you, Martha. So we're going to have a little video before we call Tigge. It's M Mr. Willem Frankenhuis. This is my son, Lucas. Lucas is about 10 months old. Now, if Lucas would grow up in a harsh and unpredictable environment, it's likely that some of his mental abilities will suffer. He might have lower intelligence, lower ability to inhibit his behavior, and his language skills might be less developed. For decades of psychological research have focused on such impairments, and these impairments are well known. In my research, however, I focus on a different question, which is, is it the case that children who grow up in harsh environments also develop enhanced skills and abilities for navigating these challenging environments? So for instance, they might have higher creative abilities, they might be better at reading other people or reading social relationships. So on my research, I focus on hidden talents, I work with youth growing up in high adversity conditions, and I have a positive approach where I focus on their skills and abilities instead of just focusing on their deficits. What we need in the end, of course, is a well-rounded approach where we understand both the pluses and the minuses, and then we can tailor school contexts and jobs in such ways that people maximally benefit from the skill sets that they do have. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, hi, my name is Tsege Tefessa. Oh, hey! <laughs> I see some friends in the audience. I did not know that I would have friends here. This is not something I often do. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal life and how a lot of this is quite surprising and strange speaking here at the MoMA. Um, yeah, so the title of my musings is Solidarity is Possible um, but Not Inevitable. And so kind of uh, what, uh, well, for one, shameless plug, this is the title of a installation project that the collective I'm a part of called Bufu is about to launch in um, late summer, early, early fall. So keep an eye out. Um, but also, um, I guess I'm, mm, I'm a little curious about this topic of friction. I think, um, you know, a lot of especially like black and brown folks probably would agree that we live in constant friction and I definitely don't go looking for more. Um, I think it's a really interesting um, idea to introduce that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal life and I think though I have learned a lot through struggle, I don't think that it was something 
that was inevitably a good a good thing that I would wish on other people. So um, I'm also much more of like a maker and doer. So you're gonna see a lot of videos, and I'm going to speak amongst them. But they, yeah, just like bear with me. Also, it's my birthday, so you have to be nice to me. <laughs> so yes. Yes, give me lots of applause, um, <laughs> and that, that'll be my gift from you to me. So, yeah, I'm going to start with this little video. <laughs> Amen. Nantum, Zero Agar Matachu, Berin Ankoktachu, Salamatachu, Exavir Amla, Kanantagar, to lick an agar no lenny, to lick Cabrino, Exavir Varcachu, Bodu, Tagat Gavas Muni. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, so that clip is, um, is from the first um, minute of a collaborative documentary that the collective I'm part of, um, Bufu, is working on, um, looking at Black, Asian, cultural, and political relationships. I chose to start with that clip. Oh, and if you speak Amharic and you're in the audience, um, which is Amharic is one of the languages from Ethiopia, and you are looking at my translation, and you're like, that's not 100% correct. It will be in the final, <laughs> in the final cut. Um, but the reason I wanted to start with that clip was for one to kind of ground this conversation um, in a place, in a spiritual place, a place where um, that this work of solidarity, this work sitting in the honest to God friction that we have every single day, if you wanna open your eyes and take a look around, <laughs> um, is that this is a part of a much longer lineage um, of work and also is, yeah, uh, a blessing, a blessing to, like this is a blessing to share these stories, it's a blessing that I am sharing the story with you. It's a blessing that I was given the gift to, to share that in this space. Um, I just thought I wanted to kind of start there. Also, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the documentary project and this, this little group uh, as we move forward, but just to give you context around the video. So it's the start of our, of our kind of collaborative documentary film that we've been working on for about three years now. And it's um, the voice that you're hearing is um, an Ethiopian veteran uh, who fought in the Korean War. Ethiopia and Korea kind of have this um, sister-brother relationship because of this, um, this moment in history. And so um, I also was thinking a lot about just that a lot of this work is gonna look very beautiful. <laughs> it's, I just came back, this is gonna sound very strange. I just came back from a monastery. <laughs> Yay, I'm a cliche, it's great. Um, just a little hippie girl up here sharing her feelings. But I just came back from a monastery and one of the last days I was there, this sister nun shared this song and it was, um, it was like, the, there was no, no lotus comes without like mud. And so we're gonna be looking at a lot of lotus, but also it came from a lot of mud. And yeah, so just, Wanted to start with that. Um, so, Bufu, that's us. Oh my gosh, so exciting. So you can read that if you want. Um, so Bufu is a collective made up of myself um, and three other dope folks, um, Catherine Tom, Jasmine Jones, and Sonia Choi. Um, we also had a fifth member who started this project with us, uh, June Kwan, who um, suddenly passed away at the start of our project, and, but is very much a part of the work in spirit. She was really engaged in a lot of work um, looking at uh, like Asians for Black Lives. And kind of at the inception of this project, it looks, oh, I have two minutes? Holy crap. Okay, let me just play this video. It'll talk about us and we'll move forward. Bufu, bias for us. 
Fufu is a collaborative living archive centered around pan-black and pan-Asian cultural and political relationships. Our goal is to facilitate a global conversation on the relationship between black and Asian diasporas, with an emphasis on building solidarity, decentering whiteness, and resurfacing our deeply interconnected and complicated histories. We attempt to achieve this through collaborative programming, visual archives, and through building long-term partnerships with collectives, organizations, and individuals. We, the founders of this project, are a collective of queer, femme and non-binary, black and East Asian artists and organizers. Boo foo! Boo foo! Buy us! Fuck you! So that's uh, that's us, and this is me. Um, <laughs> really quickly, um, again, that work came, this work has come from a lot of challenging hardships that we were seeing between black and Asian communities. It's not because we thought that things were going well that we decided to do this work. Things were really challenging, and we thought that um, if, if a way to tackle that work would be to kind of look at creating language. We tried to have all these different meetings between black and Asian folks, and they oftentimes just ended up being really contentious and challenging. And it just occurred to us that oftentimes, even though we had been going through different relationships to white supremacy, capitalism, we oftentimes didn't share a language to be able to communicate. Um, and yeah, uh, I also wanted to share, this is me, uh, a young scammer, um, twinkle in her eye and everything. Uh, I, with, with this conversation, I was really challenged by some of the questions um, that were brought up. I am the daughter of a failed Marxist revolutionary of a very bloody and challenging Marxist movement that did not work out, and uh, a woman who was a part of uh, a, a failed and ousted monarchy. So uh, that makes for a very strange child who grew up in the States. I dropped out of high school, um, and I think that was the beginning of my um, inter my distrust of institutions, um, my understanding that this these spaces are not made for us. And I think I began to uh, approach work and approach, like I think it's very foundational to how it, we bufu, we move. Um, we began to like, yeah, distrust these spaces and make demands of spaces instead of oftentimes being invited into them, if that makes any sense. Um, I think that this is a great thing because, um, you know, like in theory, we've been in a whole bunch of museum spaces and art spaces, one minute wrapping it up. Okay, um, it's great, but also it's terrible. <laughs> it would have been to me a lot better to have been care taken for and invited in. I don't think, um, I think there's just a lot of contention and a lot of work to be done and to uh, glorify that as something that we should be looking for when it's already in the room is um, not super necessary. Uh, keeping that in mind, here are some words that you can either read or not read. It'll probably be online in the website. Um, but we, in doing a lot of work um, in community and holding spaces all around New York and um, having these conversations, we try to caretake for the discomfort in the room. We try to have really honest conversations. We try to do this work as transparently and thoroughly as possible and are constantly shifting and changing and learning and growing. Um, and are just, yeah, yeah, doing the, doing the things. So that's an abridged version of what I wanted to do. Here's some other slides that you won't be able to be, yeah. And we're doing a thing. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Siga, and happy birthday again. I was going to let you speak and then say happy birthday at the end, so thank you. Two videos before we move on to Kasha, please. The difference between solving a well-defined and ill-defined problem lies in the way we have to think in order to reach a solution. A well-defined problem has a clear end state and a known set of procedures to get there. To solve these types of problems, we need to focus on the processes that brings us towards a solution. An ill-defined problem, on the other hand, is much more open. There's a myriad of potential solutions and a lot of different ways to get there. 
In order to solve these types of problems, we need to be creative and explore different alternatives. Trends in society suggest that we are now moving towards more and more well-defined problems in our everyday lives. This may limit our capacity to be creative. The reason for this is that the mindset we use in one problem-solving situation often transfer over and are being used in the next. The convergent thinking mindsets suitable for tackling well-defined problems are not suitable for the exploration and the imagination that we need to solve an ill-defined problem. Working on more and more well-defined problems may therefore limit our capacity to be creative in the future. I think somewhere along the way we've become fundamentally mistaken about what makes us happy. For some reason we've decided somewhere that pursuing pleasure and happiness on its own is the, the right way to maximise um, our happiness and enjoyment, satisfaction and well-being in life. Yet what we've forgotten is that part of being happy is also experiencing its opposite, pain. Without pain there's no contrast to happiness, there's no edges to the experience of happiness. Endless happiness becomes a kind of dull and boring and uh, pointless existence in some sort of way. Pain is what gives life meaning and purpose. It's sometimes through our struggles that we, we learn the most, that we grow the most. It's our struggles which teach us. Um, and and they, it's also our struggles which give us the capacity uh, often to connect with others as well. It's often in our, our times of uh, shared difficulties, our shared adversities and challenges in life that we connect with other people and we become bonded with them. Thank you, and I would like to invite Kasia Urbaniak now, please. <laughs> this one mine? Hello? Hello. Hi. So, um, I would like to begin by proposing the idea that we live in an extremely conflict-avoidant society. And I don't just mean the nice people. Normally when I say this in a room that hasn't been prepped for the direction that we're going in, there are people who are like, how is that possible when all we see is violence, aggression, fighting? How do we live in a conflict-avoidant society? Well, the way I see it, we're a little bit about conflict the way a New Yorker is about a roach in their apartment. It's one of two ways. <gasps> or kill the fucker. Killing the conflict, crushing resistance, is just another form of avoiding conflict. So if you have like the image of um, maybe something that happened millions of times in our human history, where you have a tribe or a village, and the opposing tribe, shows up over the hill and all of the sudden all of the men get up they go to meet the opposition to crush the opposition while all the women and children run for the hills so the two ways of dealing with resistance with conflict with friction are so ingrained in us in, in my belief that it happens in human interactions constantly in a day a person from morning till night Avoid, crush, avoid, crush, avoid, crush. Crush being just another way to avoid conflict. So whether you're a dictator, crushing all a, a resistance, any form, in order to create a toxic mimic of peace, or you're a good girl who's avoiding conflict by withholding truths that are essential to the health of the community and conducting violence on yourself, through an act called conformity. Both, both are forms of avoiding conflict. And in terms of human relational skill, we really generally lack an understanding of the art of friction. The art of staying in the space of resistance. So, there's a third way that doesn't involve crushing resistance, running from resistance. There's a third way that applies to government, household, 
business, romantic relationships. And now I'm going to take you into the dungeon. <laughs> so in the past, I spent maybe 17 years working as a dominatrix. And um, very quickly and early on, I made an observation. Here I am in this like fake position of power, where I get to tell my submissive, usually a man twice my age, 10 times my income, not 100. I can tell him to do anything I want. Neil, sit up, head up, head down. This is amazing. Go over to the window. Pretend the drape is a dress. Neil, crawl. How long does it take before that gets boring? One hour, two hours, three hours? I started to realize that the most interesting things happened when I hunted his resistance. Chest up. There's a contraction in the chest. There's some kind of resistance. This isn't even a fuck you. This isn't even a, even a disobey moment. This is, hey, you just resisted me. What's going on in your chest? Did you feel ashamed to stand tall and proud? What I started to realize, and I didn't even know the impact of this realization until far later in life, is the thing behind the resistance, even if it's automatic and bodily, the thing behind the resistance. Resistance does not show up by accident. If somebody is trying to protect themselves, even unconsciously, on any level, it's because the thing they're trying to protect is something they fucking care about. And suddenly, I started to understand that every single person who's presenting resistance and creating a potential for conflict isn't just fighting against something. They're also fighting for something. And so this began to inform so much of my work. Because here we have this conflict avoidance society. The women in my classes, when they first show up, they won't ask anybody for shit, especially if they think they're going to get a no. So we teach them to play with no. Now, students who've taken my classes, when they hear no, what, you know what they say? They go, fuck yes! Because they know they've hit the gateway to the greatest intimacy they're going to feel, the greatest connectedness. They're going to get to know by navigating that space what that person really fucking cares about, where their passion lives. Not they're fighting against, but what they're fighting for. What, what is most important to them that's so important they're willing to put up a wall? And then there's this, so the, the motto of the school is conflict without violence. Because the, the violence actually kills the friction and the sensation of friction and the opportunity to learn anything. Kills the soul of the thing. Conflict without violence, peace without conformity. How do you have a society where there's peace, not the toxic mimic of peace, where a dictator's oppressing everybody who's different. And how do you have a society that knows how to engage in conflict? How to step into that space of friction, stay curious, stay in the heat, stay in the kitchen, stay in the place that's so uncomfortable. See the other and get behind to reach the thing they care about. So we built an entire school on how to do this. And the first thing that happened when Trump got elected is we had to transfer all of this from its gender, gender, like how women in particular avoid conflict into teaching people how to have political conversations. Because there's no place where it's more difficult than when you have a Trump is good, Trump is bad. Because right now what we have, our idea about conflict resolution is this shitty thing called compromise. Where you have Trump is bad, Trump is good, let's create a compromise. Okay, Trump is a little good, and Trump is a little bad. That's a Frankensteinian monstrosity of untruth. Or in relationship counseling, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, let's do a little of each. Let's just democratize dissatisfaction so that everybody suffers, but a little bit less, but at least we're all together. The magic that happens when, when a human being is able to stand in the space of friction and conflict, see the other, get to what's behind the no, get to what's behind the resistance, and touch that passion, touch that thing, that, that tender thing sometimes that they're trying to protect. What happens is in that connection, it's not a little of this, a little of that, a third narrative that embraces two mutually exclusive realities begins to emerge. So it's not 
this mutually exclusive reality and this mutually exclusive reality have to pollute themselves, a new solution starts to happen. And the, the incredible gift that this is, the ability to witness the other over conflict while standing in this friction and this resistance, releases imagination and creates a whole new game for everybody involved. I believe that if people learn to do this relationally in the form of the dyad, then every interaction, every social interaction is a form of education that makes it so that we're not always choosing between going to war or all the nice people staying quiet and being really nice. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Kasha. Now we have uh, a video by Matthias, Matthias Laschke. Change needs friction. Routines must be disrupted. Unfortunately, people experience friction as negative. To make productive use of friction, we develop an aesthetic of friction, a set of principles to guide its design. Our pleasurable troublemakers are embodiments of this aesthetic. They create friction by presenting choice in moments where there hadn't been choice before. Key moment, for example, disrupts the routine of thoughtlessly using the car by dropping the buy key in a crucial moment. This invites reflection. Pleasurable troublemakers are material arguments which unfold through interaction. It's easy to feel annoyed by friction. To make it more bearable requires additional strategies. Troublemaker become pleasurable by being understanding, a little bit naive or even ironic. Key moment has many elements of this. For example, keys can be exchanged so that the car key drops whenever you want to take the bike. But obviously, in the end, by cheating, you only trick yourself. Pleasurable troublemakers suggest alternatives in a situated, compelling, but sensible way. Brian, take it away. <laughs> I lead a um, design and brand experience company in San Francisco in New York City. Um, and uh, I'm a cisgendered, occasionally infantile, omnipotent, sometimes passive aggressive uh, um, creative director here um, in New York City. And I've never followed um, such an incredible dominatrix. So, <laughs> so friction abounds tonight. Um, and also friction is a mechanism in our uh, work for creating meaning in our daily, everyday work, not only as process, but also as output for our clients um, that we work with. So I'm gonna talk really quickly about two projects that we've done, one uh, very recently, and then one that um, I did when I was a creative director at an agency called Ogilvy & Mather that you might be familiar with. So um, quickly, in 2017, um, uh, Friction uh, was a, uh, as a sort of, uh, can be created as a contradiction of expectation. If you've ever been to Camden, Maine, you've never seen something as aggressively peaceful, as aggressively beautiful, and as aggressively New England as Camden, Maine. It is, it is absolutely beautiful, and uh, for the last 20 years, 1,000 scientists, technologists, writers, artists, designers, CEOs, provocateurs, descend on this place for about three days for a really fantastic, conversation about the role of science and technology um, in culture and on the future. That conference is called PopTech. And we were invited to design it. And we developed this idea called Instigate. We, needed, we were at a point in our culture where we needed to sort of spark new ideas and spark a much more assertive conversation. And so PopTech called and said, can you sort of help us develop this idea? And we said, sure. So one of the things that we did was we were, so the first thing visually, we wanted to be really aggressive in this sort of incredibly beautiful New England town. Um, and then sort of we did things like this, it was outside the beautiful Camden Opera House um, and sort of registration, all visually very aggressive. And once you arrived in this rather spectacular opera house, it is really beautiful and super elegant. Historically, what they've had at these events, when they open up, are really, really elegant by very famous graphic designers, films. And um, that's been the, the consistent thing, is it's in beautiful Camden, Maine. Let's make it really beautiful. Let's make it really nice. We're going to have three days.
these uh, really collaborative conversations. And I said, let's not do that. Instead, what we decided to do, if, since Instigate was the idea, we took the idea of friction as the idea to kick off the conference. And after a thousand people sat in their seats and the lights went down, this is what we showed them. So that's, how we, so that's how we kicked it off, and it was an amazing three days. The idea that friction was friendship was a really powerful thing, and we, we had a rather amazing three days. This is what I love doing. We filled the town with all these pop tech bags, so um, toward the end of the, uh, the week, or the end of three days, they were everywhere. So it was a fun thing. I, I would, I'd like to talk more about this, but I'm going to jump now really quickly to 2005. And uh, I was a creative director, um, and I ran the design um, and the... Uh, uh, experience division at Ogilvy and Mather. And at the time, we were asked by a brand that Ogilvy had actually launched in the 1950s. It's probably in your home. It's probably in your mother's home. It's probably in your grandmother's home. And that brand was Dove. And Dove had been around for a long time, and they were aggressively looking to create a movement, not just in the skincare and selling. Here, I'm, a, I'm an advertising guy. I'm going to talk about selling soap. Um, but what they wanted to do is move out of the soap category, and they really wanted to move into this category. They wanted to be seen as a beauty product. And so when you do that, and when you enter a new category, then friction has to be, happen, because you have to talk really quickly, at, tonight, two minutes, <laughs> as, uh, to talk about how you sort of enter a brand new category. Um, and what we wanted to do is disrupt the category. So we quickly saw a global study in 2005 that was developed by um, Unilever and actually the Harvard Medical School with young women of college age, they had this incredible survey where they found out 90% of them wanted to change something about the way they looked, 25% of them had eating disorders, 67% of them said negative body image presented them, prevented them from participating in life-engaging activities like going out to school or speaking out about things that were important to them, and 2% of them considered themselves to be beautiful in 2005. So we asked the question, what does beauty look like in 2005? It hasn't changed, you've seen it. It looks like this, this, this highly, highly airbrushed, highly controlled. 
And then if it didn't look like that, you might all remember, if you were around in 2005, um, that even something, not even beauty, but even in other categories, like eating hamburgers, if you remember this ad from our friend Paris Hilton, uh, which you probably remember about how beauty was perpetuated there. And even when we saw people who did not look like Paris Hilton, maybe a lovely middle-aged woman, even then when they were presented, there was something wrong about them. Real women, real stories, but it's actually an ad for Botox. <laughs> so there's something wrong with you if you're sort of not 22 and you know, built like that. So it was a problem. And what our team believed at the time, and what we thought was interesting, is that beauty should be a self-defined concept. Women of all ages, all colors, all shapes, all faces, all skin types and all hair types are beautiful. And how, how you appear should be a source of self-confidence, not insecurity and anxiety. So we said, if we're going to enter a category, we're going to move into beauty, no one's talking about this. And that's where the friction is. Let's push that. And so what we decided to do is we were curious about this question. Could Dove become an agent of change to help reframe the way that media talks about beauty? And so one of the things we did was we said, instead of doing an ad campaign at first, let's invite, we invite, invited 70 women from around the world, accomplished female photographers, and say, what does feminine beauty mean to you? And we got the most amazing photographs back. I'll show you some of them. It didn't look like Paris Hilton. This, these. This is, a, uh, this is a former dancer who lives in the outskirts of Las Vegas, a wrestler from Minneapolis, two, children, uh, two kids from uh, 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 Germany. So these are sort of amazing images. This, this is the same woman. She liked being both sort of mod, she said, as well as traditional. And so we ex examined you know, our, our granddaughter and our grandmother. And then there's traditional beauty. We asked uh, Annie Liebos to, to, to send us a, an image as well. This woman, we weren't, she, do, she didn't know how old she was. She was probably close to 100. That's her husband. And so we got these really wonderful images. And instead of turning into an ad campaign, we decided to turn into a touring exhibit, which we launched in Toronto. And it looked like this, so we quickly had people go through it. All of a sudden, you had a different conversation about what feminine beauty was. And it exploded in the press, and then Unilever said, well, if people are responding to those images, what will happen if we actually put images like that in advertising? And so at Ogilvy and Mather, both uh, in the Frankfurt office and the office in uh, New York City and in Chicago and Toronto, this is what we did. Is she wrinkled or is she wonderful? She's 96 years old. She's from Brazil. And then we put her in Times Square and people could vote. <laughs> is she 44 and hot or 44 and not? People could vote. And we started a new conversation. Again, this is 2005, 2006. This was a member of my account team. And she ended up going on Oprah. And then we actually sold product with it. And it changed a big conversation. I knew an editor at Elle magazine, when, was the, when these ads started to appear, she didn't know where to put the traditional beauty ads. And then it took off and exploded everywhere. And, and then, of course, our culture barometer ended up on Oprah. And then what happens, and you have a, then the culture starts to make fun of it. And, and Conan O'Brien decided to put his real men for real beauty as well. So the conversation shifted primarily because we embrace friction as the possibility for enabling creative provocation and change. And the campaign still continues from 2005. The, cam the most recent campaign was a series of ads around Dove sketches where women were told, um, were uh, invited to talk about themselves, and police uh, artists would draw the way they, they felt they looked. And it was a rather remarkable campaign. So um, there you go. Yay, Brian. Thank you. No, no, you can, no, you can all join me now. So we're gonna, you're going to be next to me. We're going to have Kasha here. Yutsige wanted that chair. And this is going to be Martha, please. So thank you very much for these great, great um, presentations. So in a way, everybody kind of agrees except Tige. Well, Tige maybe also, but the friction is um, a, a good thing and uh, that it needs to be used well. So. What was the most irritating moment tonight for each one of you? <laughs> no, it's like, I would like to I would like to hear because I was thinking about it. I was trying to think. So let's start let's start with Brian. What was the most irritating moment? Two minutes. Huh? Two other uh, two minutes. <laughs> that's okay. Perfect. But I know. But, but you know but, but you had me move because we have a lot of people. No, but that's get the over. funny thing. Yeah. I know that I'm annoying, but at the same time <laughs> I like it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to do it. <laughs> so, okay, Maybe you got me. I know. I just, it's one of the parts of my job that I like. Okay, great. Ticket, what was the most irritating moment for you? I thought we were going down the line. Um, no. Okay, <laughs> skip to me. Uh, maybe because I started with my irritation. Um, I think, also your Sorry. scarf. Um, I'm the most irritating. Uh, <laughs> I know. Oh, it's good to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think this whole concept of running towards friction is strange to me. Um, I think it would be, v it's, I mean, this is, you know, brilliant panel. It's great to hear from all y'all's work. And then also, I, you know, there are brilliant people in this audience, and we are quite, I think, tuned into what's happening in the world. It's a very fraught time. I think, uh, to me, running towards making it more challenging is just very, just so strange to me, because I think it's like, uh, we could also just be acutely aware of what's happening in, in spaces and in the room. I think also one of the, one of the questions and one of the things I think have also been brought up is this idea of niceness. Mm -hmm. which I think is really um, interesting and like PC-ness. And I mean, all of, the, all of the work that I'm engaged in is like looking at the kind of like all these positions, these places of discord and trying to envision a future that feels better, which is like in part because, you know, whatever. I want, there's like this higher love for the world that I want people to be well. Part of it's also just like, I would like my own life to be well. Like I've seen a lot of hardship. I, you know, I in this body, um, walking around every day, finding my way to this, to even like little things on the way to finding this room. Uh, hello, MoMA, this was great, but also had some interesting interactions with folks. Um, I think I, yeah, and I think I'm also like very curious of the sometimes, when it comes to PCness and niceness, the fear and anger that comes up for, for people to just kind of acknowledge elephants in the room. Like, I think if there are people who feel, like maybe sitting here are like, oh, what do you, what do you mean? Like, also, I saw you say you decentering whiteness and then somebody punched someone, like that's messed up, da, 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 da. I mean, like, yeah, but also like, I, I want, I would like an interrogation of why there is this need for niceness. I think mm -hmm. also niceness oftentimes is like respectability, is legibility, is often equated with um, behaviors that are, that come from, you know, white supremacy and, and, and I, I wanted to get it out because I could yeah. tell that you were irritated well, by that. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's also like, I don't really, I, I mean, irritation, yes, but also like, I don't think that I or the work that I do really lives in a place of mm, reaction either. Like, I think I can see irritation and friction and I think I'm like much more interested in like, okay, like, let's see what this is and like building an alternative. Mm -hmm. So I think also like a lot of, I didn't get to get into all of Bufu's work, but a lot of what Bufu, what we try to do is also model alternative ways of making, alternative ways of like future looking. But um, anyways, yeah. that's kind of- We'll get more of it. We'll yeah. get more. Martha, what was the most irritating moment for you besides the light in your, in your I'm eyes? I'm sorry, it's a, yeah, serious, no, that's, I completely it's understand. a serious problem. I can't. I completely understand, I'm sorry. I can't do it, mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. Doctor's orders. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't have a mic, but I don't think I need oh, one. Yeah, you, okay. don't have, you do have it. Where what happened it? to it? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I thought that was turned <laughs> yes. off. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Sorry. They prefer, they prefer handheld. Uh, yeah. It's their choice. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm just trying to make things easier mm -hmm. for people. <laughs> <laughs> I, there wasn't an irritating moment. Uh, I have sort of larger concerns. I feel like I'm in some kind of strange space where I don't actually know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like, why am I here? What do I have to say to these questions? Uh, you're here to make my dreams come true. I'm oh, your biggest well. fan. Uh, Martha, you're here. That's well, nice. you're here because you you're here because was, that essay was screaming at us, but also you're here because of all your work because it's been about making people uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't mean to make you so uncomfortable. You felt you had to answer that and reassure me. <laughs> of course, um, that's my but, job. I'm always trying to reassure. Right. Like, well, I'm nice. So a lot of... <laughs> mm -hmm. I hope we this all, email finds you well. Are we all? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, so th that's the conflict, isn't it, between mm -hmm. um, 
the need of human beings to aggregate and to, you know, form alliances and come to some understanding and eat dinner and uh, lie in the sun or whatever, go swimming, whatever you want to do, or have sex or run around the block rather than, you know, punch Richard Spencer, which also has its place, <laughs> which was nice. Um, so I'm more in the punch Richard Spencer moment. We are living, I mean, I may love you all, but this is a very specific protected space. Um, and I have periodically said things at MoMA that made me a pariah, which I always find interesting. Oh, so, so have I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you but get I'm a salary here, and I get injected, so, mm -hmm. so to speak, or mm -hmm. I get shut down. Mm -hmm. um, and it has to do with what, what are the walls of the permissible. So we're always saying, okay, well, how far do I have to push or what do, I, what do I need, what sword do I need to pick on that is absolutely insupportable? But I think that's a childish impulse, to be honest. Yeah, it's like so, screaming an insult in the church on Sunday. That's what I always Which felt. reminds me, yeah. this is a hell of a lot like church. And I'm from one of those other religions, you know. Uh, where we kind of do things more in a communal way than in a churchly way. So um, that also is odd. And also the uh, Western European videos seem, or except for Hawaii, but, or I guess one from Australia. I thought, well, those are nice, but do they, the problem with academics is they always come up with bizarre ideas that are sometimes useful and sometimes not. Uh, but it's just the formulation That's of, uh, it, it's wonderful to see the dissection of uh, human behavior sometimes narrated like Professor Leon James from Hawaii to me. I, I fell in love with him because yes. he was just like talking about, huh? Tell me, figure. It, but isn't it like, I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm like, why am I here too? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and maybe you out there know better than I do. <laughs> but um, isn't it also just kind of gross, right, to sit there and study people and their hardships to see, like, how, what came out of that? You know, I, I think, like, I oftentimes I think I end up in these spaces, at least for myself personally, like, I say yes because I feel like I'm, like, on recon I joke about being reconnaissance, on reconnaissance often because I think that there are important things to learn from how the, the belly of the beast functions. But how and would you feel if all of a sudden you were not in reconnaissance? How would you feel if you were embraced by spaces like MoMA? Um, how would you what does that, find yourself? I don't know that, there, that institutions like this actually have a capacity to embrace someone like me. I hmm. think that true, I think if, if this space wanted to embrace someone like me, there would have to be an entirely new look at accessibility of the space, that would look at also like mm, like price points, that would look at like how the space feels, I think why, like what, how the, how the function of oftentimes but museums, happened, institutions. if that happened. If that happened, I would be very happy to not, I mean like I don't, I'd be very Are happy to. Are you sure to, you would be happy? Yes, I don't know where this line of questioning is coming from, it's very because strange. Because sometimes, I think it, sometimes yeah. it's, uh, it's about, also we were discussing, sometimes we define ourselves, and I'm talking also about mm. myself, I'm not putting it on you only. Um, sometimes we define ourselves by what we can fight against. I don't think about fighting against, I think about building. Like I think like we, like when it comes to the community I'm a part of, we're really interested in like, what do like, like being on reconnaissance to me is like, learning about things and then putting them in application. Like I am not a theorist, mm -hmm. I'm not an academic, I don't aspire to be in a lot of different, I'm not, I have no allegiance to the art space, I'm not of the art space, that was not my upbringing. My upbringing was community organizing and then things got coded into art spaces and I scammed them for resources. You know, I scammed them for visibility so I can get leverage more resources, but I have, like I don't need to be invited back here. You know, mm -hmm. like if I do, great. I'll take that as a whatever that is, and I think we in my collective will too, but uh, it's, it's not, and I also am very interested in the read of, of, of people, I think, like me, who are trying to wage new spaces and worlds of being continually in a place of reaction. I think you said something really interesting um, about like 
hearing from someone's protest and the no, hearing the world that they want to build. And I think that that's really at the heart of what I think about doing in the work that I do. Great. Kasha, what about you? Was there a moment that irritated you, that provoked friction? Um. Maybe not a particular moment, but this, um, the closest thing I could identify to irritation would be this uh, renewed, this remembering of how in situations where very well-developed intellectual ideas, very nuanced conversation that um, can move so uh, delicately and quickly, it feels to me like the top branches of a tree knowing how long it takes to get from that beauty down to the trunk where the action takes place. Mm -hmm. the, the feeling of like, the more sophisticated the thought, the longer it's gonna fucking take for it mm -hmm. to be applicable to the world. Yeah. And Definitely. the more subtle and nuanced it is, the more it's like medicine for the earth. Mm -hmm. So just feeling the like, ah, uh, of that, yeah. maybe. And also, just like greedily, I'll just tell you, seven minutes of talking, I, I want to take everybody I out know. of the audience and start teaching you guys exercises, like right now. That's going to happen, <laughs> I'm sure. No, but that's, uh, it, it's where it starts. It's true, there is, like a, um, there is a superficial level to the discussion, but at the same time, it has to start somewhere. Oh, I that's didn't mean that. superficial. I mean, uh -huh. in general, the more intelligent, the more sophisticated, the more nuanced the conversation, the harder it is to know what to tell people to do with it. It takes longer for it to kind of trickle down until we have an actual like, hey guys, let's stand up for this nuanced, subtle, brilliant, beautiful idea and sentiment and context. Mm -hmm. Like, give us a Neanderthal's thought, build a wall, and everybody's in. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's quite true. Um, is Nancy Spector, are you here, Nancy? I thought you were coming. No, because I wanted to discuss a little more what museums can do to um, get this conversation continued, you know, so, but, and I thought that Nancy would be here also. Um, uh, I have another question for you. Are there, something that Eric and I discussed while preparing the conversation was personalities in history that used frictionism as a means of communication. It was so difficult to make a list that was not um, superficial, that was not limited, that we decided instead to ask our speakers which personalities they admired the most that were able to actually uh, use conflict as a way to build. So I wanted to ask you all, is there anybody in particular from, it could be Richard Pryor, or it could be instead, uh, you know, it's, it's anybody that in particular um, resonated with you and that you admired because of her or his or their you. Please, Tigre, yes. Um, I'll be very quick about it. There is, um, a book right now that I am kind of obsessed with, and I sent in the, the, the stuff for the reading too late because I am challenging to get a hold of. Um, uh, Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, if there's anything you take home tonight, take home that. You won't regret it. Emergent um, Strategy. Emergent Strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I really, adm she's a, a, a organizer and an activist out of Detroit, and it's kind of, um, a culling of a lot of voices, mostly different organizers from across the country who are involved in a lot of different movement spaces. And it's all about like dreaming up um, how we might f create um, more functional movements, um, healthier movements. And, um, and she's like very grounded in a lot of work. She also talks a lot about transformative justice. And if you haven't heard about transformative justice before, um, it's a really dope uh, lens and practice that people are developing to an, as an alternative to mass incarceration. And it's also just a praxis that you can use to deal with um, interactions with different people. It's one of those things that like assumes that violence does not begin, uh, does people who enact violence do not enter violence for the first time by acting it, if that's, if that's mm -hmm. right. So that these things are a part of much larger framework and that when, what if we looked at mass incarceration and um, different instances of violent encounters or challenges with different individuals as less of like um, punishment based but consequence based. Um, anyways, I think she's also someone who looks at a lot of um, science fiction. She does a lot of like 
um, speculative fiction and using science fiction as a way to build alternative futures, um, talking about movement spaces and people who do it, dream up different future, equitable futures for us as being um, kind of like science fiction work and how, yeah, mm -hmm. that's really Afrofuturist and lit. Um, so yeah. Emergent strategy. Emergent strategy, mm -hmm. Adrian Marie Brown. Thank you. Anybody that you thought of? Um, yeah? D Diana Vreeland. Sorry, Diana Vreeland? Absolutely. Ah. I love Diana Vreeland. I love her, juxt her juxtapositions and also my favorite quote of hers, which is elegance is refusal. <laughs> no, yeah. no, she no, was no, amazing. no. And, and, and the kind of the incredibly aesthetic juxtapositions that she would put things in to so make you pay attention to both of them at the same time, yeah. aesthetically, were incredibly transformative for me. Um, mm -hmm. The other person I was really inspired by, and we, we just were working with the Henson family for the last three years, is the work of Jim Henson. Jim Henson. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and how he used conflict. And how You're all used, familiar, Jim Henson. Yeah. He's creator of the Muppets, and then also one of the founders of Sesame Street, and he pushed them very, very early on to take those crazy characters that he had created for the puppets and push them into the real part of the story, which all the educators at the time were adamant that it would be more like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, where there, there was the imaginal world, and then there was the real world. And Henson really pushed for the imaginal puppets to appear in the real world and to transform that show. So he was particularly good at managing that kind of creative conflict across his entire career. Creative conflict, yeah, but you know? then the friction was not perpetuated by the Muppets character. It was like, he, it was behind the scenes, the friction, or you think that also the characters themselves inserted both, because there's, a, there's always this, there's the most powerful characters, the Muppets, always have this sort of friction that happens between them. There's always someone who's trying to keep things under control. And there's someone who's always trying to break them you up. You should have seen when Cookie Monster came to Mom. I'm not kidding. It was just like, it was like yeah. mobbed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have these two characters. You get, you get uh, Kermit, and you get Miss Piggy, and you get yeah. Ernie, and you have Kermit. And between, in, in between those, that's what becomes interesting as a story, but also becomes incredibly compelling to watch. Martha, do you have a character? Uh, Again, this is, I, I, my mind doesn't work this way. I'm excited by universes of discourse and the contributions that various people make to uh, open my mind to ways of thinking and thinking about things that I don't know about, things that I just had no idea existed historically or ways of thinking that I didn't know existed. And to pick out a name is just not possible. I but know. it's. It's almost a, a physical, well, it is, uh, it's the absorption in figuring out what it is that people are talking about uh, is riveting for me. So, the thanks. friction that I'm having is there's this nuanced, rich, complex conversation that's unfolding here. And I feel like working in advertising, our job is to kind of get that friction into a sort of a digestible, space that people can quickly absorb. So I've enjoyed how diverse these conversations have yeah, been. No, and course. then by contrast, I get up like, here's a, here's a video spot, and here's an ad. And so I feel, like I'm, I, I feel like I'm participating almost in a different conversation. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. It must be, uh, is that conflict aversion really in yes. work? Yes. Yeah, right. You know <laughs> it, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, so perpetuated by a culture of self-attack. Self-attack. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? Self-attack? like. Oh, forget it. <laughs> no, 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 explain. That's interesting. Um, is it like self-denial, self -denial, No, it's the, it's, it's one of the things that happens to me when I'm teaching is I can feel very acutely what people's bodies are doing when their energy is retreating or when their energy is advancing. And there's a way in which it's like when there's too much intellect in the room, the body starts to do this really funny thing of retreat, advance, retreat, advance. And it's a form of self-attack. What do you teach? I power. teach power dynamics. Power. So I, I, I wanted to answer and the to question. And to whom do you teach it? I teach it to women in a way that makes it so every single person they teach, every single person they interact with, they're teaching, whether they know it or not. So they're mm -hmm. teaching. They're putting men in their place. <laughs> 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 but I wanted, to, I wanted to say, you know, one of the interesting things about that question is I can't, oh, you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine uh, a single person who hasn't, who's made a significant contribution to this world or a creation. <laughs> <laughs> who hasn't uh, ruffled feathers or created friction. I mean, if you even think about biological life itself begins with fucking, which is fundamentally the art of friction, <laughs> right? 
like <laughs> friction. I don't think there's anything. I don't think there's any generative force outside friction. Rub two sticks together to start a fire. Like what we're talking about is the meat. You know, resistance and resistance meet, and they either have conflict or friction. If one gives way, there's no friction. If the other gives way, there's no friction. And it's those two points, two people have making a point, having a point, um, having that solid solidity, having that hardness, having whatever, an ideological opinion or a stance, or even biological basic bracing resistance that makes it possible for friction to exist, which makes it possible for those walls to break down and for new things to happen. We need containers. And we need, so, so that things can flow, right? And we need wa those patterns and walls to change as times change. So I mean, even, even, even like, you know, human behavior needs to change. The, the longer a wall has been there, the harder it is to break down, but sometimes the more necessary it is to break down. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, very gonna, long I'll answer. Huh? Like I was gonna say La Belle oh. Otero, just to be really controversial. La Belle Otero? Yeah. Oh. One wow. of the world's richest prostitutes from 300 years yeah, ago. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, that's her, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. thought. Yeah. I mean, she, she, was, she was a groundbreaking woman who created a lot of friction and <laughs> did everything the wrong way and ruled a little kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, I would like to open it to the public. I have, as usual, a page of questions, but I'm sure you might have some, too. There's somebody. Oh, is Asher? Yeah. Hello. Um, my question I think about every day, and how do you approach friction, especially productive friction, when there is a disconnect of reality between the two opposing parties? For instance, science and religion, or Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> So, Martha, you take it. Sorry. <laughs> it was cute. Sorry, it was yeah, cute. Yeah, yeah. Don't look at me. I don't know. No, you don't want to answer. Well, so cash. I deal with yeah, this all the time. Yeah. I, I'd say it's actually science and, and magic, not science and religion. Um, okay. That's my take on what these two oppositions are. But there's a perfect example of productive friction. Mm -hmm. um, they are separate worldviews, but when those worlds collide there is often a rethinking of what is scientifically just and accurate. But you know, all those X-Men movies and everything, we seem to be stuck in that right now. Uh, not just X-Men, but the entire you know, galaxy. Doctor Strange, it's Frankenstein. We're, something that our culture is still struggling with post-enlightenment is what's the difference. Between science and religion. What can we extract from each without having to say, no, it's all wrong, or I'm only, uh, like, what's his name, the guy, the biologist who's such a Dawkins. jerk. Who? Dawkins. Yeah. Dawkins. Tinker's not so great either. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them. Yeah, right. Yeah, Richard, I, I got it. Thank Gosh, you. you Sorry, Richard Dawkins. Yeah, I love this question. I even love the way that you phrased it, because the way that you phrased it led me to believe that, like, where do you even begin when there's this disconnect between two apparent mutually exclusive realities or narratives, like Democrat, Republican, like science and religion. Um, so uh, in the way that I work, like the first thing I would say, well, first of all, I would say, so awesome that you're trying, right? <laughs> but the first thing I would really say is there's no such thing as science or religion or Republican or Democrat. There's just people and conversations. So when you're trying to make a connection What's happening a lot of the time is people are throwing these really mental, ideological schema bombs at each other, like as if they were bombing each other's houses, right? Like, this is what I believe, take it. This is what I believe, take it. And one of the first things that, in order to start creating a new way of thinking about everything, is to actually move, move away from thinking. Um, when two people are trying to relate to each other, one's a religious person, one's a scientist. Uh, it's the same thing that I was talking about when I was uh, giving my little talk about how, well, what's the thing in you that is behind your religious conviction? And what is, what's the heart of that? And what's the physical experience, lived experience in your body? Like not just head, heart and body. What is the lived experience you've had that feeds that whole and supports that whole either passion for religion, need for religion, 
And you cannot, here's the other thing. In, I run a school on power and influence, and one of the things I discovered is you absolutely cannot influence something you do not approve of on some level. And I don't mean you have to approve of the Holocaust. You have to approve of the fact that it's there in front of you, enough to engage with it. This is the thing I'm talking about when I'm talking about conflict avoidance, right? Like not wanting to go there. You have to go, oh, this person's religious in a way that I am not. What's, 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 what's the thing behind it? What is it they're fighting for? And if a person's willing to do that and do that to themselves, right? Like, okay, my scientific logical conviction, I'm not about to give up my belief in fucking reality, but what's, what's at stake for me? And through this process, people start understanding that communication is actually like 10% ideas and words and 90% primal communication. When you can, we can, you can start connecting on the level that's very fucking human. This is hardest with uh, uh, family members. This is hardest in long-standing relationships because those are the most fixed. But in, in, in uh, relationships that don't have such fixity, you can watch this shit happen and it's fucking unreal. Like people get moved, people start having new ideas about things. And I feel really passionate about this, especially at this moment in, in terms of what's going on in the world. We lack this skill. And us lacking this skill as human beings, smart people and nice people being quiet and, and, and everybody else being aggressive, vulgar, and violent, like we don't stand a chance in surviving on this planet without this skill. There's a, in the middle over here, please. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I think that you know, there are good aspects and bad aspects to friction, but I think that also a lot of the time um, to get to the benefit of like going through a trial or tribulation, whatever the case may be, like a lot of the times people wait till their back is against the wall or until they have no choice. And there are people who are very in very comfortable situations, let's say, where they're also suffering in a way, but they don't want to go through the friction to have the positive end result. So my question for you, um, any of you, would be what do you think are ways in which, like, if you see that there could be some sort of benefit to friction in, throughout different levels, how do you get people to want to go through it if they're comfortable? What was that last sentence? That, how do you yeah, get people missed... to want to go through friction if they're comfortable? There are people that don't want to go through friction. Yes. Yeah. This is something Tiga, you were talking about before. Yeah, I mean, I'll just like respond to this in like a little way because I, hmm, I think I also like this ringtone. Yeah, hey. I know it's a nice ring. <laughs> um, don't worry about it. It's okay, It'll, Joyce. Don't worry about it. I, I, I quite enjoy it. So yeah. I'm like, there you go. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I think, mm, I think all the time of like, hmm, hmm, hmm. Okay, cool. So. I don't know how, I mean, I'll try and get into it. So with the collective amount part of Bufu, we've done like all kinds of programming like all over the city. If you haven't come to our programs, I guess come if you want, but if not, that's okay too. Um, like I think almost over like 200 programs all over the city um, in every borough, in art institutions, in backyards, in bars, and galleries, and people's rooftops. Um, so yeah, and I think uh, it's really easy, well not really easy, but it's easier to get folks of color to come, I think, to our programming because the work is so about like our own survival and so about like how do we build together, how do we also see where we've been having challenges and like it's like, it's intimate, right? Like it's like, oh, I wanna come, one, because you know, we're gonna have, we're gonna do, have honest conversations. We're gonna try and like think of, like have weird alternative models of like sharing all, we share all our budgets online and make sure everyone gets paid equitably and talk about equity in different ways and like are like outside, inside, doing all these weird things, right? It's like a weird octopus of a project. But um, I think a lot about like, how do you incentivize other people who would have to like really make, the, like make themselves uncomfortable to come into that space? Like I. I'm like even when uh, when I think I was responding to like if I would you know what would what would it take for the MoMA to be a place that like brought me in and like made me feel at home and like oh whatever. that was not my question well whatever the <laughs> the framing of the question is um, I'll, I'll do my best to ad address what I'm about to say in yeah. in my understanding of of that and we can go mm -hmm. back to it if you need to but um, I think I'm also often interested in like what would it take for 
um, what would what would it take to like incentivize an institution to truly be transparent and truly be uh, like radical in their practice? And I I don't know because I think and I think that's also oftentimes what hinders a lot of solidarity across spaces or maybe hinders a lot of challenging conversations is because I think a lot of people and I think it's totally fine to just be honest about it are really um, connected to their own comfort and um, would much rather, I think, things not be the way they are exactly, but be like slightly better. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I am also toying with that question of like, how do you incentivize honest and real change? Because it's not something that looks or feels especially good, especially for like, if we're looking at like, you know, let's make something a little less touchy. Um, discrepancy, well, I think touchy, but discrepancy of pay between men and women. How many men are down to just be like, I would like to take a pay cut. Um, I, as a CEO, will cut all of whatever my chunk is and I will hand it off. It's gonna be great. Viva la revolution or whatever. I don't know. Um, but yeah. More questions? Yes, please. please. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. You can use my mic. Yeah. Oh, dear girl. Um, yes. I would like to address what you just <laughs> said, that uh, people, if they have the power, they don't want to come to the table and discuss things. Why would they? You know, so when you're talking about this, and I'm always saying, how do you get people who are in a position of power want to give it up to put themselves in a place of fiction where there must be dialogue and debate in order to have some new resolution to improve the situation? Thank yeah, you. you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I don't have an answer, but I, I do. That's what, that's what my that's what I'm I'm working on, and also like if I wanted to get very quickly because I don't want to talk too much. Well, I don't know. Anyways, um, very quickly, I think um, like for myself, I'm gonna get I'm probably gonna lose some people here in my hippy dippy heart. Like I truly believe um, in the interconnectedness of people, and I do not think that there's a lot of that you can really experience like maybe like true joy and happiness when you're understanding that like there are people who are suffering to, for the comfort that you have. And I think oftentimes I'm also, the more that I've been brought into like different academic spaces and art spaces, I see this like really frightening um, anger and toxicity that people throw at each other around these types of conversations, especially folks who are like, I think studying things, but maybe don't have a practice. And oftentimes I think that that might come from people feeling, um, also really disconnected from actually enacting the kind of change they want to see. I, I don't know if that's... Can I argue with just one statement that the birthday girl made? Feel free, please. Yeah. Uh, the idea that there are people who suffer and people who don't, and that there are people who experience more friction than others, and that that can be um, identified in terms of external circumstances. Mm -hmm. I don't think any human being lives a life whether they appear to be incredibly privileged or deprived, whether they're beaten and raped their entire childhood or very well provided for, that part, uh, an essential part of the human experience is desiring something and experiencing friction in terms of going from the process of not having it to having it. But Everybody experiences. Objectively, objectively, there are circumstances you know, of, that make it more acute. There are problems, beings. there are social problems to solve, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. There is economic injustice. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking on the level of the human being, the level of the human being, suffering can be incredibly acute even in the most incredible looking circumstances. There is no avoidance of friction, which is part of why I think it's so important to learn how to work with it, how to, so yeah, how to, to use it as a generative force. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're probably gonna agree or disagree, and that's fine. Um, but I think, I, the point that I was making is that I think, mm, and because of our interconnectedness, I think it's really challenging to enjoy different parts of life knowing that you are connected in this larger sphere of things. I also would never assume that just because someone is like, you know, cis, white, male, who had a lot of money, that they didn't experience hardship. I think that's a very weird thing to think, but I also would not make the assumption that the hardship, like that hardship is equal to someone suffering in a different, like maybe like a really challenging economic situation. So, that also so how has do you weigh challenge. that? How do you compare people's suffering? I don't really need to, and I don't. Good, good point. Um, <laughs> I think I'm much more interested in being like, 
here are things that are happening clearly because of facts. And here's the world that I want to see because I want to feel better and I think we all do and there's ways to do that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, we all experience suffering, but it's also a really, to me, a very scary place to begin if we're trying to have a conversation about equity. If we're just like, oh, well, everyone is suffering and there's We're not having a change. conversation about equity, we're having a conversation about friction. Well, I mean, I guess in the greater sense of the world, I'm interested in the conversation around equity, so any conversation I'm having is one about equity. Yeah. May I ask a question? Yeah. You posted a question interesting conversation. How do you build these bridges in such a way? How do you carry on a conversation with people who come from opposite sides? And in my mind, what we're talking about is suffering. I think part of the nature of suffering is to recognize that you have suffered um, in quite profound ways. Um, I went through my 20s, and most of my male friends who were gay didn't make it out of their 30s. And yet I saw legislation during my 20s and 30s that avoided to, to recognize that um, these men um, and, and many people who had suffered uh, and died of AIDS. They refused to look at that suffering. It wasn't until, and I start, started to see some change, when um, people started to see friends of theirs, family members, and the suffering started to happen to them. So I think, I think you have to recognize and be very conscious of your own sense of suffering before you can build a bridge to somebody else's. And I think that requires a very profound sort of self-acknowledgement and a vulnerability to recognize that before you can absorb someone else's. So I think it requires that kind of um, sort of uh, openness to examining what is probably a really painful process for people. Otherwise, you won't see the pain in somebody else's heart, and you will never build a bridge. I think that's one of the things that we're experiencing right now, is this drive toward grievance, in my mind. Mm -hmm. Feeding grievance comes out of a desire to avoid the, the sense of suffering at all. I never hear it. I never hear, I never hear, I'm sorry, ooh, I went through that too, that must be difficult. I'm not hearing that from any positions in power coming from the White House. All I hear is grievance, grievance, grievance. And that's from people who deny that they themselves have been through pain. I think those people in the White House have been through extraordinary pain. Actually, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm not so yeah, sure that's really true. I mean, one thing that struck me very forcefully was when the right developed this meme that there was, a, I, did, I mean, intellectual meme, not the things we see on Facebook, mm. um, that the identity politics is a politics of grievance and, you know, of all these <laughs> complaints and so on which they've carried through on now for the last 20 years. And then I picked up um, the book of, who's that? Uh, Billy Graham. I read his biography and I realized that the entire frame of it was Christians are despised and hated and we, we are, you know, the victims in a society. And I thought, well, this is a, a contest of grievances. So, um, you, it would be interesting to have a discussion in which people would agree to talk about that. But could I propose, there are, there are conversations about individual empowerment and conversations about community empowerment and sometimes they, one section needs to be left aside and you need to talk about you, other times you need to talk about us. And one of the interesting experiences I had was during Occupy to see the way um, conversations had uh, mechanism, mechanisms by which people all got to speak and to voice strong opposition or strong agreement and the way in which people joined together with mic check, which is, you know, there's nothing stronger than communal voicing, except maybe communal dancing. But the, <laughs> I really mean that. I mean, I agree. From the earliest moments of human societies, we have been you know, getting together and singing and dancing. And that's kind of, you know, how we see in us. It's the simplest way of saying, look, it's us. But anyway, this is another way of saying, yes, we know in some ways we have a contest of grievances, but we also have a common goal, which is, you know, to put forth a community vision. You almost never get there. And I've kind of done this with my students as well. But working on it is so, empowering, uh, maddening, and wonderful because you hear your friends come up with things that you just really can't agree with and yet you have the idea in this group we would like to put this forth. So mm -hmm. it's just another way of thinking about you know, friendly friction 
as yeah, opposed to talking the guy over the tall fence. You're making me think with all your discussions about the relationship between friction and empathy and the fact that one of the most effective ways to feel is to bring home. So it's to um, bring the feelings home in a way, which is also one of the hardest things to make happen. Did you see what happened with Jim Acosta this week on CNN? No, what happened? Yeah. He was being attacked yeah. in front of like an audience, um, visibly like attack, go home, CNN is fake news. He was really concerned at one point, I think. He, you could see on his face for safety. And then apparently a woman either fell or she got sick or she was elderly, and he spontaneously picked up a chair from behind the press desk and gave it to the, the, the people who were attacking him. And it shifted. It absolutely shifted, and they suddenly had a different conversation. All of a sudden, Jim Acosta saw these people as in need, and, these saw, and they saw Jim Acosta, who has been you know, a advocate for truth in the, in, in the, White, you know, in the White House um, as, a, you know, as a reporter. Um, all of a sudden, they saw him, the, the, the perception of him changed. And Acosta spoke about this. He said, it gave me hope that we could have some commonality. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it might have been romanticized for, for the moment, but for the moment, it was a powerful story. We have one question over there. And then I, one I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the rise of trigger warnings and safe spaces and the protection of vulnerable communities and how oh, that keys in with the whole valorization of friction. Mm -mm. Who wants to take it? Mm -hmm. Not me. Not you? No? Mm -hmm. Martha, you, you're in school, so you teach. Um, but you don't I teach don't. in a college. I left. Um, well, you know, there's a place for that, and then there's not a place for that. I think once it becomes institutionalized, it's like a lot of words that drive me crazy because they've become buzzwords that people don't actually think about. But mm -hmm. to say to your students, what I'm about to show is about X and Y, and if you don't want to see this, I think this is a good time to leave. But for example, I would never do that in showing Shoah, the movie Shoah, Mm -hmm. which is interviews with people about having participated as victim or perpetrator in the Holocaust because this is the kind of immersion that people need. And I mentioned that one because I had a graduate student when I was showing this uh, who got up and screamed and ran out of the room and a couple of the other students ran after her and said she was from Kentucky and um, mm -hmm. she was white. No one had ever told her that such a thing had ever happened. So for her, she needed to be comforted that it's OK. But I think yeah. for her, it was a great thing. On the other hand, you don't want people feeling like there's a consensus in the room that somehow we're all strong, but you're some weak person who can't, who, you know, because sometimes people, that it's, they've had enough. So I think you've got to play it by ear. But just turning it into, you know, I think it's bureaucrats who turn these things into rules because they're terrified about actual, yeah, about lawsuits. Yeah. actual confrontations, yeah. actual friction. Yeah. They, yeah. It's just like flatten everything down. Yeah. It's like yeah. nothing conflict yeah. in order to avoid any kind of risk. Yeah. Or lawsuits. Yeah. Or lawsuits, exactly. Right. I'm going to take, um, well, so I'm gonna take one question first. and then one last question and then I'm going to have to interrupt but we'll continue outside. So you and then over here. Yep. Um, so firstly, thank you for the word friction because in it I feel that there's a sense of growth whilst for so long the word conflict has been used as sort of an idea of art and, and, and getting outside of your box and so on. But I find that to be a destructive concept. And here's my question. Is there a way in daily conversation that when a moment of friction arrives to, to feel oneself and make the other person feel that there is a place, a new and better place arriving after this moment? Can I respond to that quickly? Sure. And also maybe I'll say a little thing about trigger warnings because I was mostly joking because I thought that was clearly pointed at the person who put a community agreement on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't need to go too much into it. I think a lot of spaces are inherently violent for different kinds of bodies. I don't, I mean, I am also, again, this like these um, intense pushbacks against things like that that I think are really benign, I'm much more curious about than I am like anything. I'm like, where is that 
where is that anger coming from to have to, to like be like, I don't want to have to point something out. You, you should just know, you know, like I'm like, that, that's like, I think that's more curious to me. So I, but I also think, yeah, I don't think it should hinder people. I think people should still witness really challenging things. I don't think you should not have different types of conversations. But I do think like, there, yeah, anyways, that's just there. Um, and then I think in response to that question, I think it's a really beautiful one. I just came back from a really dope conference, in case any of you all are interested, called Allied Media Conference. It's really Allied, really Allied. Allied Media Conference mm -hmm. in Detroit. Um, and it's a conference for a lot of different media makers who are interested in like social change. And um, it's really well done. And they've been doing it for like 20 years. And it's, uh, it's, just, it's just a great conference. Um, and I went to a talk on, um, but with Miriam Akaba, who's like a really dope organizer. And um, in the talk, they were talking about there's this culture of like canceling people and like calling people out and like I am not really interested in, in that kind of dialogue either. And something she was saying was like, you know, you can't really cancel people because there's no other planet for them to go to. Like where are you canceling them to? Like at the end of the day, we're all here, you know? And I think, um, but I also don't think that doesn't, that doesn't mean you don't acknowledge what's happening in the space. That doesn't mean you don't have a serious dialogue, but it's also like, I think, approaching those kinds of conversations with an understanding that at the end of the day, they're still gonna be there, you're still gonna be there, the situation's still gonna be there. And I, anyways, I think that's something that I've been keeping in mind a lot recently. It's like, just because I'm also focusing, right, at POC Solidarity doesn't mean that I don't wanna live in a world with all of you, we are all here. But I'm also like very curious and interested in like, what it looks like to, for all of us to live well, um, for myself to live well. and. Anything that you wanted to add to, uh, or answer the question? No? Then I'm going to just say it's, uh, it's 8.05. And you know, usually we try to also be punctual so that we can go have our so-so wine and great conversation outside. But I would really love to, to thank you all, Tige, Marta, Kasha, and Brian, for a great evening. And you for a great participation. And Erica for her great research. And let's just go outside. Yeah, Erica. Woo -hoo -hoo. So yeah, Yay. Kitchen. <laughs> what? So really? let's go outside and uh, talk some more. Thank you.